Let's stand and read this scripture together, Springs. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. Let's continue in worship this morning. Welcome to the Springs. We're glad to have you here. Mark 1, 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. 
as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Good morning. Visiting with us, we're just really glad you've come our way and ask that you hang around, if you will, after services and give our members here an opportunity to meet you. I want to remind you that after the Lord's Supper, my wife and I will be in the Quantania room for a time of prayer. If you have any special need there, uh, we'll be there for you to, to minister to you and pray with you. A uh, couple of things before we get into uh, why I believe today is really a special day for um, for the Springs. Um, today, uh, we have one who is celebrating a special birthday uh, on Friday, and he probably didn't even know the day he was born, but he was born on Friday. I looked it up. On Friday, December the 10th, 1937, a great man was born. Lee Mulliken is 80 years old today. <laughs> Uh, just to give some clarity of how old that is, <laughs> the average wage at that time was $149 a month. Household income. Bread was nine cents, and you could buy a house for a whopping 4000 bucks. So that was 1937. Happy birthday, Lee. Also, Tim, Joshua, and Annie Trigg were baptized after services last Sunday. Where are they? Have them stand up. All right. Thank you. Thank you for putting your faith and your belief on uh, for everyone to see last Sunday in baptism and showing us that you do believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you do believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. So we're just really happy uh, for those three. Okay, today is a special day as we announce uh, a new shepherd to the Springs. Big day in our history, uh, a, new, a new leader. Uh, anyone that's been around me much uh, would probably uh, share some axioms or quotes from John Maxwell. John Maxwell is one of my favorite on the subject of leadership. Um, I was one of the original Enjoy Tape Club members back in the 90s. I would uh, go to work listening to John Maxwell back when he was at Saddleback, and it was just leadership within uh, a church setting. Uh, now he is on the circuit uh, with businesses, and he has all kinds of books, Leadership 360, and Winning with People, and the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, and on and on John Maxwell books. But one of the things that he talks about in leadership, and really in anything in life, is uh, these two overarching principles in leadership. Attitude, aptitude. Aptitude asks the question, can I? Or can they? That is what you did in this process as a church. You looked among us and you were looking for new leaders and you were asking the question, who can do this job? And we led you to Titus. Paul's letter to Titus. 
Paul's letter to Timothy. You looked at those passages and you looked at the different men in this congregation and Phil was one of them that you said, he has those things. Uh, his children uh, have obeyed him. He manages his family well. He lives a holy life. He's a disciplined man. He's not given to drunkenness. I mean, you went through this whole list of different things and said he can lead. His life is blameless. He can lead this church. And so you answered the question, can he? Then all of a sudden, the onus is then on Phil. That's the attitude. And the attitude question is, will I? Will I do it? You're not going to be worth a hoot in life or anything you do unless those two things are present. They have the skill set. They have the, uh, the mind. They have the giftedness to do something. But if they don't have the passion and they don't have the desire, it, it won't matter. Phil has the desire. And so he acquiesced and said, yes, I, I am willing. I have a passion. I have a desire. I want to be a shepherd of this church. And so this is a wonderful day, again, in our, in our history. So I want to ask if Phil and Jane and Kate and Kristen, their entire family, would come up here, um, and we're going to make a pact with them. We're going to, this is an agreement that we're going to make between one another. Yeah, tall guy in the back. <coughs> Rod, if you want to take a picture, is that how you is that how you want them? Okay. <laughs> oh, the podium. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. Phil, God has called you to tend his sheep. As a shepherd of the Springs Church of Christ, you're being asked to assume an important role, spiritual responsibility. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4, Peter says this, I urge the elders among you, give a shepherd's care to God's flock among you, exercising oversight not merely as a duty, but willingly, but willingly, under God's direction not for shameful profit, but eagerly. And do not lord it over those entrusted to you, but be examples to the flock. Then when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that never fades away. Phil, at the end of this set of questions, I'm going to ask you, if you will, wait to the end. If you agree, you'll just respond with, with God's help, I will. Will you teach and model the gospel of Christ? Will you guide us patiently and prayerfully? Will you trust in the spirit to guide you? Will you mentor and shepherd other leaders God gives to the church? Will you pray for us when we're sick, minister to us when we're hurting, and rejoice with us when we're blessed? When you, will you work in harmony to preserve the bond of peace with your fellow shepherds and with the church? And will you serve among us as Christ did? With God's help, I will. And now, church, I would ask that all of you stand. The Springs Church of Christ, we believe that God has called this man to shepherd our congregation this season. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, it says in the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And God will exalt you in due time if you humble yourselves under his mighty hand. Also in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, the Hebrew writer says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls, and they will give an account for their work. Let them do this with joy, not with complaints, for this is of no advantage to you.
Church, if you will, listen to the questions. And when I'm done, if you will please agree by saying with God's help, we will. Brothers and sisters, will you follow these men or this man in service for the mission of Christ? Will you be respectful of their leadership? Will you support them in prayer? And will you help them to maintain or help him maintain the bond of peace? Okay. As a result of this pact, this agreement, I now pronounce you husband. Oh, I now. <laughs> you are fully ordained elder and leader of the Springs here. I'd like for our current elders to come up here, Jim and Celeste, uh, Dave and Becky, can't leave yet, and um, who am I missing, Monty and Monima, who come up here and lay hands on this family, and I will lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love of us, a uh, special occasion for this, this church, and uh, what has risen among us is a wonderful man and his, his wife, Phil and Jane Lofman, and their two wonderful daughters, Kate and Kristen. And Father, you, you have been preparing uh, Phil and Jane for this moment for a long time. Uh, these two have gone through, um, uh, and you know so well. I know they've petitioned you over and over because they love you and they knew you cared for them. They have put on display their faith over and over, their faithfulness to you, their faithfulness to their family, but they've been faithful to us as a church. They've weathered all kinds of trials and storms, and they've hung in there. They've been teachers. They've been servants in different things. They've headed committees. Uh, numerous things that these two have done. And I know first and foremost is because they love you. They love you. And they're so appreciative of the grace that's been bestowed upon them that they've been forgiven of their sins and they're a child of the king. Father, we pray for discernment for Phil. We pray for wisdom for Phil. We pray that he will model his leadership here after the chief shepherd. He'll do the right thing, even when maybe times it won't be popular. But Father, first and foremost, he'll lead wanting to please you. Thank you again for this moment that we've made a pact. We've made an agreement between this church and Phil. Phil towards what his responsibilities will be to this church. And I pray that we will keep our covenant. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Okay, you can be seated. Okay. Um, we should have a candle that is already lit. Oh, there it is. It's behind me. Okay. And that was the candle of hope. This morning we now light the candle of peace. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, we remember that he is our hope and our peace. May we receive God's light this morning in the form of the Christ child, our wonderful counselor, our mighty God our everlasting Father, and our Prince of Peace. It's good to have Ryan Jones and his son help us in that. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this season. We thank you for 
season of Advent, and um, I don't know of a better word in the English language. It, it, it's just it's just a good word to even say, and it's the word peace. And Father, we probably don't even know often when we pray what we really want, but what we I know deep in there we just want peace in our life, and, and we won't find it in this world, but we will find it in you. And regardless of circumstances, you are our peace. And thank you for for reaching out to us and finding a way that we could live in harmony and in all holiness. And there would be peace between us as believers and our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and continue worshiping.
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. Have a seat, church. Second Peter three eight through fifteen. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to be to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives should you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On what day he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised. A, work, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience <clears throat> gives people time to be saved. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I want to welcome every, everyone in the name of Jesus. To our gathering this morning, and particularly to you who are visitors, we offer the peace of Christ to you, and we'd love to shake your hand and get to know you a little bit after church, if you're new to this church. We have some people, special people, who are visiting today, but they are no visitors. Don and Cindy Rokasi are here, and they are back. Yeah, let's give them a hand. Let's have them. Where are they? All right, if you guys can stand up. You get the embarrassing missionary stand up and wave. I had to do it, so you're going to have to do it. That's the deal. All right? They are back. Julia is graduating, and so they're back this Sunday and I think next Sunday uh, for Julia's graduation, and we are very happy to have you guys here. Um, welcome. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for your coming, that we are gathered here because you came into this world, that you gave us your son, and as we are in this season of Advent, waiting for you to break in on us again, we ask that you prepare our hearts. Give us ears to hear, give us hearts to follow, and God, I pray for the gift of preaching, in the name of Jesus. Well, all the Christmas decorations are, have been brought out in the house. We're running a little late. When I say they've been brought out, they're not put up. They're just scattered everywhere around the house. That's what that means. And yes, Kim t said I could say that. She doesn't bother her at all. But I'm stepping over ornaments and decorations. And... But we've got all the Thanksgiving stuff up, and now we're putting all the Christmas stuff up. I think... One of the plans this afternoon, after the other multiple things we're going to do, is put up the Christmas tree. Yes, we're late. We're late. And I still haven't put up those Christmas lights, but they're going to come. But you feel it, right? This season of preparation. Where all the decorations come out. and You've got to get the tree up. And the ornaments hung on the tree and the lights You've got to start shopping. Maybe if you're way ahead of the game, you've already started wrapping gifts. You're making plans. You're anticipating guests. You're intending parties. There's a lot to get ready for for Christmas. And Advent, is we've been talking about, means coming. And Advent is a time where the church prepares for Christmas. For the coming of the incarnate word into the world, we prepare our hearts for God to break in upon us once again. 
But this is not only a time for the church to make preparations for the celebration of the arrival of Jesus that we'll celebrate on Christmas Day. Not just the celebration of his first coming. We usually don't think about it this much, but Advent for the church has always been not only celebration and preparation for God's first coming to the world, but it's also preparation for God's second coming, for the second Advent. So like Christmas, the second Advent, there's lots of things to look forward to, our text in 2 Peter says. In fact, it says it twice, we look forward to. And there's lots to prepare for. In verse 13, Peter says this, but in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. He says, this is what we're looking for. To the new heaven and new earth where justice dwells. In other words, what he's saying is, we look forward to the time when God's going to come back in all his glory, and he's going to make everything right. We look forward to the day when there's no more cancer. He's going to make it right. We look forward to the day when there's no more abuse. We look forward to the day when there's going to be no more addiction. We look forward to the day where there's going to be no more violence and corruption. We look forward to the day when there's going to be no more depression. He's going to come and he's going to make it right. We look forward to the day when there's no more poverty. We look forward to the day when all lies will end. We look forward to the day when all in pain, hurt and pain and infidelity will be no more. He's going to come back. He's going to make it right. We look forward to the day when all children will have loving parents. He's going to come back. He's going to make it right. When we look forward to the day when there's not going to be any more death. He will come back and he is going to make it right. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to the new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. But to be honest with you, when you hear stories in the news... Stories that we've been hearing about lately over and over again. Stories about Harvey Weinstein. Stories about rampant sexual assault and misconduct. And then you hear about Matt Lauer. And then you hear about a bunch of our political leaders. And then you realize there's some that you hear about and they still deny it. And you wonder. Is it going to get any better? And then you know the kind of exploitations of women's bodies that happen on the internet. This seems to get being worse and worse. And you wonder. Is it going to get any better? And the amount of times the Me Too tag comes up, hashtag comes up, and you wonder, is it going to get any better? Will it ever get any better? Then you hear of that other couple that's getting a divorce, and you're like, not another one. And you wonder, is it ever going to get any better? Then there's another mass shooting, and you wonder. Is it ever going to get any better? When there's addiction and there doesn't need to seem to be any way out, you wonder, is it ever going to get any better? When there's deception and lies and relationships and trust have been broken and you wonder, is it ever going to get any better? 
When you hear the news, again, in some ways that can be one. When depression hits hard and there's no end in sight and you wonder and did everything just when loneliness or shame or guilt or conflict or betrayal and you wonder, is it ever going to get better? And those of us that are getting older, we have this experience more often that when you keep going to more and more funerals, you wonder, is it ever going to get better? We look forward to the day when God will come and make all things right. But we hear and experience the bad news over and over again. And we are tempted to despair, to forget, to not look forward. We are just tempted to live as if this is the way it is. Have you ever heard that before? This is just the way the world is. And we wonder, will it get any better? And this seems to be the sentiment in 2 Peter. The text we read this morning, we began in verse 8, but let's back up and begin in verse 3. It says this, Peter says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, When is this coming that he promised? Even ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Is he really ever going to come back? Because we can wait and we can anticipate for Christmas because we know it's in, I don't know, how many more days? 14. Of course a kid knows. Of course the kid knows. <laughs> and so you, some of you think, yes. You're thinking, oh, 15 more days. And some of you are like, shoot, only 15 more days. But I wonder, things just roll on for us. And there's no, only 15 more days till he comes back. And we just get kind of lost. And we're not going to say this. No one in this room, I think, will say this. But our hearts and our lives, we maybe kind of wonder. This question lurks around. When is this coming that he promised? And Peter has a word for those that ask this question. In fact, he has three different things. He says there's three things that those who ask this question, they don't ever consider. He says, first of all, but they deliberately forget that long ago, God's word, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water by water. By these waters also the world of that time was also deluged and destroyed. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And he says, first of all, here's what I have to say about his, this promise coming. You're not paying attention. You don't understand that God said by his word, he spoke creation to existence. And he separated the waters from the land. And then we know in the time of Noah that he also, by that same water, destroyed every living creature, except for Noah and all who were on the ark. And he says, but it won't be water next time. In the same way that by his word he created the world, by his word it's going to come to an end. But it won't be by water next time. Next time it's going to be by fire 
And what Peter is doing is he's drawing on a common understanding that Jews, not only Jews, but Gentiles have, at least one understanding that Gentiles have, is that the most basic element, at least one thought was, the most basic element of the earth was fire. And that the gods took fire and they molded into things like human beings and water and the earth. And one day, they also believed that the world was going to end by fire. This is not just Peter saying this. This is what some Greek philosophers thought as well. And what he takes and he says this, he says, God's, world, God's word brought the world into the world. And God's word, by his word, he could just take it out. And just bring it all to an end. And so one day, God's word is going to come like a fire or in the form of a fire. And it's going to melt everything away and leave everything bare. And we're going to know all the good things and we're going to know all the bad things. And everything is going to be stripped down to its most basic. In verse 8, he goes on and says this, the second thing. The first thing you don't know is that God's word, the power of God's word. The second thing you don't know and you don't consider is that, but you do not, but do not forget one thing, dear friends, verse eight. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. In this, this verse, we know it very well. In fact, a lot of times what I hear this verse is used to argue for creation. Right? In light of science. But this has really probably nothing to do with creation. He's talking about God's judgment is God's business on God's schedule. That's what that means. Did you hear that? God's judgment is God's business and it's on God's schedule. Not our schedule. And so the long delay that we experience should be viewed from a different perspective. And this is where the third part comes in. The way we view God's long delay from a, from a different perspective. In verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What they don't understand about this delay is God's character. God's character is patient. Time and time again, Israel, God's people, they know this patience. And then we have this story in the Old Testament where Jonah goes to Nineveh. And they deserve judgment. They deserve to be destroyed, and Jonah wants them to be destroyed. But by the time you get to chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah says this. I knew that you are a gracious God, that you are merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. Then Peter goes on in verse 9 and says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. It's almost as Peter says, this is cause for joy. His delay is cause for joy because the church says, Faithful one, Merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, not just for myself, but for the whole world. This is actually why you come together on Sunday morning. It's because of God's grace and his patience. And he's laid things bare. But even after all that evidence... I find myself in the daily grind, and it's hard to hope. 
Because even though he says he's coming back and he's going to make all things right, all the data around me says that's not the way it is. And history tells me this has been going on a long time. Will it ever get any better? In fact, in some cases, I hear this a lot, it may even be getting worse. Repentance is not common. It just seems like this is the way the world is. But Peter, first, Second Peter ten, verse Second Peter three, verse ten says this: But the day of the Lord will come, and it'll come like a thief. In other words, thieves don't make announcements about when they're coming. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. <coughs> and then what's interesting is that he turns the whole issue of Christ's second coming, the second advent, he turns it back to you and I. And he asks this question. I don't think in this translation above it doesn't have a question, but in my Bible it has a question. It will be destroyed in this way. Here's the question. Since this is God's promised future, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and God godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. And what he's saying there is saying, when these guys are saying, or when you're feeling like, when's this promise coming going to happen? And he makes this argument about it's God's word and that God's timing is different. And it's God's business to judge. And then he's slow to anger. But we feel and we yearn for things to be made right. And we want to just despair in that. He says, here's what real hope looks like. Hope just is not like a faint feeling that you have. Or man, I hope this changes. But hope is this active action in the world. He says, because we know God's promises and that he's going to come back a second time, he asked this question, so how are you going to live? So for those of us who hope in the second coming, that hope and pray that God's going to return and make everything right, he said hope looks like righteousness. It looks like living into the world that God has promised. It looks like living into God's promised future. It looks like living into the most real thing that we can't quite see fully yet. When we lived in Uganda, one of the things that our brothers and sisters of Christ taught us about was that the gospel is much bigger than just church planting. They taught us that the gospel actually addresses other things like health care and education and the environment. They actually taught us that. And so one of the needs that people in the villages that we worked with was this need for clean water. And so we got into the practice as part of our work of, of uh, helping to dig water wells. And when we tell people about this and when they found out about it, they would say, oh, so I see the plan. So you're, 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 you're meeting their physical need. So that way you could tell them about Christ. It's like, actually, no. I mean, we tell them about Christ, but we're not doing this. It's not like a bait and switch, like we're trying to have a carrot and stick. 
And then some said, well, it's just good humanitarian work. It's like, well, no, it's not just good humanitarian work. Because just because the water is clean when we initially dig the well, it doesn't mean it's always going to be clean. So people would ask, why? Why do you dig water wells? And we soon came to this conclusion. This is why we did it. It's because we believe that one day God's going to make all water clean. And we thought we should start on that now. We should live into the reality that we know is on its way coming and is a sure thing. God's going to make all water clean. So I want to end with this. I don't want to start with men. Men. We don't exploit women and view their bodies as something to satisfy our desires or let other men get away with it because one day God is going to end all exploitation. And husbands and wives, we're faithful in our marriages. Because one day, God is going to end all infidelity. That's why we're faithful. And we're a people that seek peace, not violence. We're a people that love, that don't hate, because one day God is going to do away with all violence and hatred. It's a for sure thing coming. And we are a people that can forgive and reconcile. We are a people that can even love our enemies, because one day God is going to wipe out all the hurt and pain that we do to each other. He's going to wipe out all the hurt and pain done to us. He's going to erase all the things that come between us. And one day, this is why we can love our enemies, because one day they won't be your enemy. We tell the truth, because one day, God is going to reveal all truth, and he's going to do away with all lies. That's why we tell the truth. We intervene in people's lives who are caught in sin and addiction because one day God will end all things that destroy us and destroy our relationships with one another. And we work to heal and to comfort because one day God is going to heal all depression. God's going to heal all disease. One day God's going to heal all cancer. So that's why we work. I want to say that we do everything to bring life. To bring life as many places in the cracks, in the crevices. We bring life, we bring life, we bring life because one day God's going to destroy death. That's what hope looks like. Hope looks like an ethic and an action. That's how you hope in the world. What lives should you live in view of all this? That's how you should live. That's how you hope. Because Peter says, but in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. This is what hope looks like in the second coming. This is what it looks like to look forward to Advent. It looks like preparing the way. Living into the future, God's promised future, when all things the world.
Isaiah 4, chapter 40, verse 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen, it is the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then glory of the God, then glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice said, shout. I asked, what do I shout? Shout that people are like the grass. Their beauty fades, fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass wither, withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but, our, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountains, shout it louder. O Jerusalem, shout. And do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, there's, there, the sur surveying Lord is coming in, coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. If you were here last week, you may remember that uh, Monty led a prayer uh, as a part of Migration Sunday for people who have been displaced from their homes. And one of the men that I have a great deal of respect for is an African pastor who lives 
as a displaced person and not his home country. A few years ago, Kelly and I had the opportunity to have dinner with him. And one of the things that he shared with us, that the thing that he values, that he clings to, that he cherishes the most, and he tries to hold on to the most, is peace. This is a man who has seen his country in civil war, who's been jailed for preaching the gospel, and who now lives in a country that's not his home. And as I think about that for him, I wonder if he senses the prince of peace. And we're in a season now where people are are mindful of peace or the absence of it. And as we had dinner that night, he said, I cling to, I cherish, I long for the reign of the Prince of Peace in my life and in the world. And so this morning we've been singing songs, we've been reading passages, we've heard the word proclaimed about preparing the way. We've lit the candle where we are preparing the way for the Prince of Peace to come again and reign in our world. And that's what we're going to do at the table this morning, my friends. We're going to prepare the way for the Prince of Peace to reign in our lives and to reign in the world. You see, first we're going to come and we're going to take the bread and we're going to take the cup. And we're going to prepare the way for the Prince of Peace to reign in our hearts, to reign in our lives. And so when you come to the table together, may you think in your mind and maybe even say to those that you're gathering with that the Prince of Peace is coming again. And the other thing that we're going to do today, friends, is we're going to proclaim that the Prince of Peace is going to reign in our world. Today we take our caring contribution. And it's been announced before, we're going to give our normal contribution and everything that is above that becomes a part of our caring contribution. And when we give our caring contribution, friends, we are preparing the way for the Prince of Peace to reign in our world, in the lives of the people who come to us with need, seeking hope, we're saying the Prince of Peace is present and coming to you in your lives. And so today, friends, when we come to the table, let's prepare the way for the Prince of Peace to reign in our hearts, to reign in our lives, and to reign in our world. Let's pray together. Father, we know that we need you, Prince of Peace. We We proclaim that you're coming together. And as we take the bread and cup and offer and and, uh, give our offering, Father, it is our declaration that we need you, that our world needs you. And And we pray, come, Prince of Peace, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come to the table.
stand and continue to praise God and worship together.
Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. Sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest. Peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story. Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings on Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song, and sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy unchanging love. Oh.
we close, our benediction comes from the words of Peter, as we read this morning. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Go in peace.